Fabulous. Welcome to Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology. Today we are doing stomach case studies. We're, we've got three case studies to look at as we progress through our time together. And so I'm really looking forward to this. If you've been with me before, you know that I have way too much fun with iridology and way too much fun teaching it. So I'm glad you're here. We're going to be together for about 90 minutes. I hope you've blocked off 90 minutes. I have, and I'm totally focused on this to really uh, do the best we can. I'm going to invite you to please get rid of any distractions you possibly can. If you can turn off Facebook, if you can turn off Instagram, turn off your cell phone, Speaking of which, should I turn mine off? Just make me just let me double check here because it would not do to have the student, the teacher's phone ring in the middle of class, would it now? Okay, and there we go. That is out of the way. Um, I just want you to make sure that you've got paper and pencil to take notes because there's going to be some great information and you're going to want to do notes. I'm absolutely sure of this. Now, I'm going to ask you, we are, as, as we often are, we're a small group, and so I need you to play all in. Is that okay? Will you, will you play all in? If I ask you to do a poll, will you do a poll? If I ask you to raise your hand, well, I know you'll raise your hand. You already did. Um, so will you commit that you will play all in? If you're going to play all in with me for the next 90 minutes, let's have you raise your hand. Yay! Okay, thank you, thank you. That makes my day. Because you will get so much more out of it if you play all in and if you can shut out the distractions. So that'll be awesome. I'm teaching right up to the last slide. I've changed the format slightly. So we've got count content right up to the very end. So don't leave early, stay with me. There's good stuff right till the end. Regardless of whether your specialty is nutrition or herbology or naturopathy or homeopathy or osteopathy or massage or chiropractic, yeah, iridology can benefit all of those practitioners in their work. So regardless of which one of those fit you, you're in the right place right now. You're going to leave with the information you can use. So I, I'm going to start with a poll. This is our first play all in. And because I do need to know a little bit about you to know how to tweak this on the fly. If you've been with me before, you know that I do that. I can tweak things a little bit so that they are more appropriate to the audience. And so you should be looking at the, the poll right now. And awesome. So we've got a We've got the whole span here of background. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Okay. And um, let's look at those challenges. Actually, just a show of hands, how many of you have been with me before for an iridology webinar? Yeah, okay, you both have. So some of this is gonna be pretty familiar. Thank you so much. Like, there's only two of you on right now. There's another five that might show up. So we'll see how that goes. And I'm not trying to minimize by saying only two. There are two valuable people with me today. That's how I should say that. And five more might show up. So some of this will sound familiar and um, just ride with it, go with it. You might hear it from a different angle today depending on what your mindset is. So today, um, in, in the education to become a holistic nutritionist, or for those of you who are just starting out, one of the, the drawbacks to most of the education there is that they teach you that niche of what they're going to teach you, but they don't teach you how to integrate it with everything else that you could or that you already know. And so when we have that happen, what happens is that you've got all of this knowledge, but you often don't know exactly where to start. They didn't teach you how to pick a starting, a middle, and an end, or how to create a logical sequence of events to help your client. They just taught you all this information. And that can be a huge challenge. And that often will mean that as a practitioner, because you don't know where to start, you'll do that first appointment with your client, you'll give them a little bit of homework to start with, send them off, and then you go and do two or three or four hours of your own homework, doing research, developing programs for them, and that's typically not time you're actually getting paid for. 
right? When the client was in your office, you might have charged them $100 for an hour or maybe $50 or whatever you charge, but you charge them for that hour. So when you go off and do another two or three or four hours of homework, you're not getting paid. If you did want to count that in your paid time, let's say you charge $100 an hour and you go off and you do another two hours of homework, and that's the minimal end from what I've heard in talking to practitioners, you're only making $33 an hour. That might sound really good until you realize you've got all your own overhead to pay. You've got to pay your wages. If you're a limited company, you've got to pay your own source deductions. And even if you're a proprietor, you've got to put away your own taxes out of that. And I mean, you've just got all the expenses that have got to come out of $33 an hour. And are you really working even a full six hours a day to make enough money to get this all done, the chances are likely that you're not because it's that's just the way it goes when we're in this kind of an industry. We run into a third challenge and that is that when we've gone and done all this wonderful homework for our clients and we've developed these beautiful reports, just like the case studies we did in school, we bring back this case study for our client and it's everything they need to know. We are offering them all the information we possibly can. We think we're giving good value, but I'll tell you why we're not in just a minute. And because they're so overwhelmed, they don't come back again. They think, I could never do that. I am so out of here. That That's perfection, can't be there. Or they think, ah, there's the two pieces I can work with. Okay, that's all I need, I'm done. Right. And so they don't get served because they're not continuing on their wellness journey. And you are in that predicament of always having to find new clientele. Are these any of the kinds of challenges that you're facing uh, for those of you that are in practice right now or if you're just starting out in a practice? Are these do these sound at all familiar to you? And if they don't. Ah, thank you. If they don't, or even if they do, I'd like you to type in what are some of the other challenges that you face in your business on a regular basis? I'll give you just a second. I'll grab a sip of water while you type in what some of your other challenges are. Lightning fingers, lightning fingers, right? If you are typing something, would you just raise your hand so I know to wait for you? And if you're not typing anything, that's great. You know, one of the other challenges that I face is there just doesn't seem to be enough hours in a day to do everything I want to do uh, in my business and in my personal life and just everything, right? There's there's not enough me to go around. So that's a huge challenge and I'm learning to delegate. But And what I'm going to teach you now in today's webinar will really help and it does help me as well. So how do I know that these are your challenges? Well, I've been there myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you should have seen how complicated the programs were I used to give to my clients. Oh my goodness, it's a miracle any of them came back after the second appointment. It was awful, just awful. And I would book one hour and spend three hours with them, thought I was giving great value. Uh uh. No one ever taught me how to break it down into homework, into dual, doable pieces that my clients could be successful with. They didn't teach me how to integrate the iridology either. I had to figure that one out on myself on my own. And I've interviewed a lot of nutritionists and herbalists and other practitioners. Almost every one of them have been there as well. You know, spending all that extra time with your clients and on your clients just creates a massive amount of overwhelm for them. And it's not necessary and it's not helpful. So who am I? You know me. You've been with me before. I'm a holistic health coach, have been since 1981, got a lot of good years of experience under my belt. Master herbalist since 83, that, you know, thinking 1983 doesn't sound strange to me, but if any of you are really on the younger side of things, that probably just sounds like I'm ancient. Nutritional consulting practitioner since 94, 
Yeah, my grandchildren think I'm ancient too. Natural nutrition clinical practitioner since 2016, certified iridologist since 93, and boy has iridology changed in the last 25 years. Oh my stars, it is night and day different. I love that there's ongoing research and I'm sharing with you the latest stuff. The stuff that we now know is correct until the research proves it wrong, right? Uh, certified comprehensive iridology instructor in 2016. I've been teaching wellness to professionals since 85. You know, when I started out way back in the early 80s, there weren't a lot of classes available. Most of what was available was correspondence as in write it on paper, snail mail it, wait for them to send you back stuff. and you know, it would take forever to do a class. And so as I started amassing information and learning, people asked if I would teach. And that was how I started teaching in 1985. I was still kind of wet behind the ears. I'd only really been at this for four years, but people wanted what I had. And that was how I, how I started. I'm a wife of one, a mom of seven, and a grandma of seven. And you know, in all of those years of having my business, while I was having my children, and raising them, I can tell you I've made every mistake that you can possibly make in a business. I've paid a lot of money, spent a lot of time on classes and courses and materials that in the end weren't the right answer. I've spent less money and a lot of time on courses and mentors who were the right answer, who've helped me to get to where I'm at today. And so that is my, I feel that's my calling in life now is to teach iridology, but to take my students who learn from me and help mentor them to success and help, help, help them avoid the mistakes I made. So if that sounds like a good trip, I want you to raise your hand. That sounds like something that you'd like as a, a personal tour guide, right on. Perfect. So you're in the right place then. So if you are new to iridology, iridology can help you get rid of those intake forms and you probably can recite these because you've been with me before. Eliminate your intake forms. You need your waiver release forms because you need that legal protection. It can help you to start creating that deep rapport from the moment you start the consultation. Instead of you looking down at a form or looking at a computer at a form that your client has completed online for you. Uh, rapport takes eye to eye contact. You know that the, this thing, it takes eye to eye contact. And iridology, you're looking right at their face, you're looking in their eyes, and you are positioned within their space to be able to develop that rapport. It, uh, iridology will help you do a core assessment in less than five minutes. So get rid of that lengthy paperwork that's going to take you hours or at least half an hour, 20 minutes to work through all the way. Know the right questions to ask, prioritize what needs to be dealt with first, and create a therapeutic priorities list for future consultations. It'll help you to eliminate your unpaid homework time, and it will help you to stop overwhelming your clients. I've had a lot of, um, of students who have been certified by other iridology schools and were frustrated with it because they were not taught how to integrate their other uh, modalities. But I really work to make sure that we've got that. So I do need to ask another poll here, again, just so that I know what we're working with. And that is, what training do you have in iridology already? None. And none means includes if you've been hanging out with me on these, these little one and a half hour sessions, that still is none because it's not complete. Um, Jensenian or certified in Jensenian, constitutional, certified constitutional, IPA, and other. So none yet. Okay. And none yet. Okay. Awesome. So you're both pretty new and that's fabulous because we will work with that. Just make sure that poll closes properly. Awesome. So that might sound too good to be true, that we can actually simplify the entire process for you. Teach you one more modality, and a lot of people go, do I need another modality? I've got so many already, and I don't use them. And yet this modality ties the other ones all together. It helps you to actually use all of your other modalities so much more effectively. You'll eliminate those lengthy intake forms, the two or three or 20 page intake forms, whether it's online or on paper, get rid of them. That's what iridology will help you with. 
I was, had a student who was new in the class a year or two ago, and I was speaking with her, and she said she had just been with a client. She was a master herbalist and several other things, and the client was complaining about filling out three pages because of the arthritis in her hands. Hmm. That same practitioner, student practitioner, um, had booked one hour with that client and told me later that she'd spent three hours with that client but only charged the client for one because because well that's just what she does and that's a problem for a couple of reasons the first one is that if word gets around that she is only charging a hundred dollars for a session but a session is three hours long it's going to be really hard to back that bus up and and start charging a hundred dollars for the hour that she really was supposed to be charging or that she said she was charging and you know when that gets out people really begin to expect it and then you're kind of hooped it's really hard to stop that and the uh, the second one is you know we're not supposed to torture our clients and if your clients got really bad arthritis you don't want them struggling with that or maybe you've got a client who's dyslexic and they're embarrassed about the fact that they don't read well and they don't understand what you're asking for here so we don't want to torture our clients at all. We really want to make our sessions as user friendly as we possibly can. Now, because you've been with me before, you know the answers to some of these polls that we're going to do. So stay with me. Okay. So what, um, okay. Just let me get caught up in my notes here. I'm kind of free-forming this a little bit to make it more interesting for you today. So when we do iridology, we want to have equipment. We need equipment. Every modality has equipment, right? Whether you're a massage therapist, you've got your table, and you might have blocks, and you might have different cushions and things like that. In iridology, we need equipment. And this is the piece de resistance. It is an iridology camera. You're just starting out. I don't want you buying a camera. This camera is like $5,000 worth of needing to be insured, right? And so while it's beautiful and the, most of the images we look at today were done with this camera and the clarity is like, oh my goodness, brilliant. It's not where we start. We want to start where we can afford to start until such time as we know we love this. So again, we need a, a lighted magnifying glass and we need a pen light and we need another magnifying device. Now you can kind of get away with... Um, with having just one set, so just a magnifier and a pen light. You can make that work, but I will tell you there's a serious advantage to having this piece as well. And really for all of this for $75 or less, you've got it made in the shade. So this is an 8X or an 8 power jeweler's loop. Um, and so you're looking for something that is between a 5 and a 10X in there would be great for a start. You want a pen light that's a really white light. And if you're getting the lighted magnifier, this one was from Amazon. It has, I think, a 2X, a 5X, and a 10X that are interchangeable. Now, the reason you want both is because this is nice. It's one-handed operation, right? You just turn it on and bring it in from the side and get it where you want it. You can see what you want, but you cannot move the light around. And moving the light around uh, independently of the magnifying device gives you all kinds of freedom and flexibility to cast shadows, to highlight things with the light, to see the eyes in many different ways. So the, the handheld gives you the ability to um, move the light wherever you need to independently of the magnifying device. So I encourage you to have both of these. It's just a really nice setup when you've got both and it's not expensive. So hopefully that's doable for you. All right, let's do another poll. What kind of equipment do you need to start doing iridology? What kind of equipment? Do you need a pen light with a magnifying glass, a microscope, a telescope, a periscope, or a 24 megapixel camera, which is what this beauty is? Yay, I love it when everyone gets it right. That's awesome, thank you so much. Let's do a quick review of the stomach because we're doing stomach markers today and we have a question that has come in. Just let me open my question box as well. Oh no, Emily, your battery is dying. Oh, if you can get plugged in um, and recharged and come back to us, please do. We don't want you to miss this. 
So if you can get onto a charger or get plugged in, come back to us. Just come back. Come back, Emily. Don't leave. Okay. So hopefully we'll see you soon. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So quick review of the stomach. The digestion begins in the brain, right? Do you agree with me that it begins in the brain? And so Elizabeth, it's just you and me. It's just you and me. Elizabeth, because it's just the two of us, I'm actually going to unmute your line. If you've got a lot of background noise, you can mute yourself. Do you have a mic? Yes, I do. Oh, yeah. Well, we can actually chat rather than having you raise your hand. That's you so cool. A bit of a private tutorial with because it's you and me. Awesome. So you probably are also familiar with the idea that digestion starts in the brain, correct? Yes. Awesome. That's great. And we've got those messages going from the brain to the digestive tract and back up and down. And we know that our gut has so many cells that are actually are our, it's our second brain. So that's important for us to remember as well. Mouth is where we chew our food. We break it down mechanically into small particles. And there's enzymes there to help us digest it. And then the food is pushed into the esophagus, which comes down to the stomach. And this is where we are going to focus. The esophagus has peristaltic action that works to push the food down. What is missing from this diagram, and I wish was here, is the diaphragm. I wish we saw the diaphragm here. I need a different image that shows the diaphragm. Okay, I just need to make sure I have that open. There we go. Okay. When we look at the stomach lining, we have a normal, healthy stomach lining with this mucosa layer that has in it the, um, the cells that secrete mucus and acids to help us digest our food. If that mucus layer is not strong enough, if there's not enough mucus protecting the stomach, we end up with the stomach digesting itself with its acids. And if it gets bad enough, it is an ulcer and they can be pretty tough to actually get rid of. They take some serious, serious work. Couple of questions here. Can we see genetic predispositions uh, in the eyes that suggest an increased risk of issues with the stomach lining? What do you think? Uh, yes. Yay, you got it right, good job. And when we see markings in the stomach, like we're going to look at today, that suggest a less resilient stomach lining, does it mean the person will absolutely have stomach issues? What do you think, Elizabeth? Not necessarily. Right on. Good job. Good job. And last question. If there are no stomach markings, does that guarantee the person will not have stomach pro will not have problems with his stomach? What do you think? Uh, no. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now tell me, are, are do you have the nutrition background? Yes. Okay, good. So um, this is all probably making super sense to you. We're yes. going to do a good, good. And you've been with me before. Were you with me on the, the class two weeks ago where we went over the, the different markers? I believe so, yeah. This is my okay. third one with you. So. Oh, yay. Good. Well, yeah. I'm glad to have you aboard. Thank you. So we're, gonna, we're going to review those markers really quickly before we go into doing the case studies, just so that they're really fresh in your mind. But just... Before that, do I have another poll here? Okay, yeah, this is a um, this is again another good one that we need to be aware of. So with this one, I'm going to have you actually click in your answer for this, even though you could just give it to me. Um, iridology is a di diagnostic tool, and we can name stomach diseases by looking at the iris. True or false? Okay, so I'm glad you said that because it gives me a good chance. You've been with me a few times and, and now I can really work on some education. Awesome. Um, the answer to that is actually false. With iridology, it's an assessment tool and it teaches us what questions to ask, but it never gives us a disease name. Okay. So I, I can't look at this and say, oh, this person has disease XYZ, but I can see, for example, that we have 
comb teeth here. So when we look at this, you can see that from the edge, we have these little dark lines that radiate into the body of the iris from the pupil. They're actually, the technical name for them is minor radial furrows, but when we're looking at stomach lining, we give them the name of comb teeth. When we see comb teeth, we know we need to ask certain questions about digestion, and these are going to be very similar questions for all of the markers we look at today. Um, are there problems with digestion? Is there stomach gas, burping, belching, bloating? Does, do you have heartburn? Does food sit heavily in your stomach? Is there a history of excess stomach acid? And is there a history of ulcers? This suggests that the stomach lining genetically lacks integrity. But just as one of the earlier questions said, just because we see it doesn't mean there's absolutely going to be problems. If the person does the right kinds of things with their diet and with their lifestyle, they can actually be totally symptom free. They do normal things with their diet and lifestyle. And with your nutrition background, you know what normal means. It's likely they're going to run into problems. So when we see the comb teeth, we need to ask digestive questions. The next marker was the gray border. This is such a beautiful example of a gray border. You can see this thick gray line at the edge here. And the question we really want to ask is, how well do you absorb nutrients? But what we know is that most of our clients haven't got the foggiest what that question means. How would they know if they're absorbing nutrients, right? And so we need to reframe that question into terms that they would understand. So how long does it take, to take uh, soft tissue injuries to heal? Like if you get a cut, are you, is that cut there for weeks and weeks? Or is it like three or four days and it's who, who you had a cut there? Or surgeries or broken bones? And how's your hemoglobin? A lot of people know if they're anemic. And if they're anemic, they probably are not digesting and assimilating as well as we would like to see. Now, when we see this, you likely, you might see this one with handheld equipment because it is really prominent. But most gray borders are thinner than this. They're narrower than this. And so it'll be harder to see them with handheld equipment. When we see the gray, it means less reactivity. So this part of the body lacks vitality. And this is the stomach lining this is correlating to. And so we, again, we are going to ask these questions, but we can ask the questions we asked for the last slide too, about burping, belching, bloating, history of ulcers, problems digesting foods, and especially in this case, problems digesting protein. And so, um, again, with the gray border, we're going to see all of those common digestive symptoms. Then we have the stomach ring. The stomach ring is this pom-pom zone encircling the, um, the pupil. And what this actually is, is the iris is made up of layers of fiber. We call it stroma. And if there are layers of fiber missing, we can obviously see, it's like if you've got, a, if you've got muddy water, but the, um, the water, the mud is settling, you can see further down in because there's layers of mud missing, they've settled. This is the same thing. If there's layers of fiber missing, we can see further down into the stroma. And as we see further down into the stroma, what we actually see here is the outline of the sphincter muscle that constricts the pupil. Now, because this is all the nutritive zone, if we've got layers of fiber missing, it suggests that there is a reduced integrity in the digestive zone. And if we see the outline of this ring really clearly, it makes us want to ask these questions again about the stomach and about how well the stomach is wants to handle things. 
So as we look at this, we're going to ask again, any problems with digestion, with burping, belching, bloating, heartburn, food sitting heavily? Do proteins digest okay? Or, or do you avoid certain proteins because they just don't work well for you? We're going to push in that direction. Now, Dr. Bernard Jensen, who is the father of North American iridology, who laid the foundation from which we've developed modern iridology, says that when the stomach ring is, a, is darker, it means a higher risk of low acid in the stomach and if it's white higher risk of high acid in the stomach and so um right and so as we look at this then i mean we're starting to realize oh my goodness there's an awful lot to learn and so that's where i get to tell you about confident nutritionist dynamic iridology this course is starting again on May 31st and it goes till the end of October. You've got a choice of an 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Time day. So we started at 11 a.m. Mountain Time today. So that gives you an idea of when it would start in your time zone. Or 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Again, I'm not sure where that translates to where you are. Space is limited to five students per class. I really am picky about making sure that my students um, get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention and have all of their questions answered. My goal is to turn out iridologists who can stand shoulder to shoulder with the best iridologists in the world. I want them to know their stuff, be confident and know how to integrate it with what they do in their office, in their own practices, so that it's useful to them. Let's look at our first actual case study. This is a male in his 30s. He first called me to ask if, we he was a teenager when I first met him. He used to be our babysitter, so a long time ago. And he remembered that I did this holistic stuff. And so he looked me up, I'm pretty impressed that he remembered 20 years later that I did holistic stuff. And he called me and he said, uh, Mrs. Cobb, and I'm going, okay, okay, you're old enough to call me by my first name. You don't have to call me Mrs. anymore. And so he said, Mrs. Cobb, uh, can you help me with a stomach problem and I said well tell me about it and he said well I've got really really bad reflux and heartburn and the doctor wants to put me on Pantalock well I knew a little bit about this this young man and after um, we moved just after he after he was our babysitter and then he got into a really rough lifestyle with a lot of alcohol a lot of drugs a lot of just a really rough lifestyle and then he straightened himself that around and got married and had, had children so really really cool but but he still had not learned much about nutrition and he was still not doing very well in that department. Um, he was working in the trades, so he was actually a plumber's apprentice. And so that meant that you know, he was on construction sites a lot. And you don't show up on a construction site with a salad unless you want to be laughed off the site, right? So he was showing up with the kinds of food that the guys would eat on a construction site, which is not very good choices. So he came to me with, with this problem saying that he was going through an economy sized jar of antacids every week. Now, if you see a problem with that, <laughs> so do I. And because of that, the doctor was now recommending a proton pump inhibitor called Pantalock, which, you know, not a great option. So he'd given me a lot of information, even just in that initial phone call. So when we met face to face, there wasn't a ton that I needed to ask him. As I looked in his eyes, um, the first thing that I wanted to know was, uh, was that was, was there a time of day when it was better or worse? And was there anything that he was doing that made it better or worse? Looking at his left eye, which is on the right side of your screen, so it's like we're looking at his face here. What I noticed is that this stomach ring area is darker than most of the rest of the eye. So that suggests that he actually probably had lower acid, not higher acid. And we know that if the stomach is too alkaline and that is coming up the esophagus, it will burn just like high acid coming up the esophagus. So that was one issue. Um, and then we looked around the edges and, okay, I'm just looking at these slides because I had prepped some blow ups. Okay, they're in the other next cases. And what I noticed as I looked really closely um, as I had these blown up huge on my computer, you can't see it very well here, is that there was 
um, a little bit of roughness, a little bit of comb teeth starting as well, and lots of minor radial furrows. They're not very dark, but a lot of them, you can see little bits of them in here. Now, radial furrows not only set up comb teeth, but they tell us there is interruption in the nerve feed to the stomach, which of course will inhibit or mess up the enzyme release and production. And so, um, when I asked him the question, is there a time of day when it's better or worse? He said he usually felt really good when he first got up in the morning, but breakfast was his turning point. And if he skipped breakfast and went to work with only fluids in his stomach, it felt awful. Uh, even breakfast didn't feel good. So I asked, well, what do you have for breakfast? And he said, well, white toast with peanut butter and jam and a cup of coffee. Okay, there's like about 15 things wrong with those four food items, but you gotta start somewhere, right? And um, and then I said, so then what happens if you've skipped breakfast and you're just going to the job site? He says, well, I've got my coffee. And then when I get to work, I pretty much will drink like two liters of Coca-Cola a day. Oh, so water? Nada. Herbal tea? Nope. Uh, just coffee and cola. And that was it. So now you'd probably, would you tell him to get rid of the coffee and the cola? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> We're so on the same page with that. And so I did. You know, it's my opinion that no one should drink coffee ever. No one should drink cola ever. And some bodies that have a really strong stomach can tolerate it for a while. But if there's a stomach ring, it's not going to be a very long while. And so we need to get rid of that. I once had a client, and I wish I could remember which client it was because, um, it was many, many years ago. She came to me, so I'm doing a little side trip here. She had a lot of nervous system issues and she'd been in a major accident and was not healing well and was on long-term disability while she healed up. And as we were talking, she was telling me she would drink like 20 cups of coffee a day. And I, so I said, so tell me about breakfast. And she said, well, breakfast is like four cups of coffee. I said, and what do you have to eat after that? Well, you know, when I start to get hungry, I'll have another cup of coffee. What do you eat for lunch? Uh, that's usually another three or four cups of coffee. I said, and where's the food? Oh, I don't eat. I just drink coffee. I'm thinking, you are lucky to be as well as you are. No nutrient, not even a vitamin pill, not even a bad vitamin pill, just coffee. So we worked, I worked with her for months and months and months and months. I don't remember if she had a stomach ring or not. You didn't need a stomach ring with that much coffee going in. But we worked with her for months and we gradually, now the first goal was, can you get it down to no more than eight cups of coffee a day? And for breakfast, I would like you to have an egg on a piece, on a half a slice of whole grain toast and um, lunch, I would like you to have, and we were working with teensy weensy servings because her stomach hadn't seen solid food in a long time. And we gradually were able to build her up to where she was eating a smallish meal three times a day with a couple of snacks, and she was off the coffee completely. And of course, then her nervous system problems started to correct because she wasn't depleting because of the coffee. So that was just a side trip. Let's get back to our plumber friend here. Um, so what we talked, I talked with this young man about nutrition and gave him some doable, doable ideas for breakfast. And we started out small. You know, you can't take people and turn them on a dime. Have you found that, that if the changes are too big, they just can't? Uh, I haven't actually fully started my nutrition business yet. I'm still, I just finished classes and I'm writing my exam this Friday and then Ooh. I'll graduate. So Ooh. yeah, I'm, yeah. So I haven't quite well, taken class yet well good luck with your exams that's that's Thank exciting you. that you're at that stage yeah so we really worked with him and gave him some breakfast ideas things that he could um that were quick and easy things that were even portable and said you know what if you really want to feel well fast you're gonna have to make a huge change and that is no more coffee and no more fizzy drinks at all and it was like that the initial was, I mean, what, you know what? I don't want to be on Pantalog and I don't like the way I feel. I will do it. I was like, yes, yes. 
And so after a couple of days of being on the no coffee, no pop and having a real little bit of a breakfast every day, he sent me an email saying he, his stomach wasn't perfect, but he couldn't remember the last time it felt this good. I went, yes, yes, yes. Love it, love it, love it. I did give him a herb to use just in case he needed it. I gave him a little bit of slippery elm. And beyond that, it was just really mostly getting rid of coffee and pop. Um, when we saw him later, we actually had him come do some plumbing for us. And uh, he's totally off all that stuff. And he said his digestion was perfect. He had no problems whatsoever. And I was so excited because when they do the homework and they get the results, they're more likely to maintain the lifestyle. And that's what we really wanted. Now, there are things that mess up the stomach really badly. We know smoking does. We know excessive alcohol intake does. Soda and fizzy beverages are bad. Greasy foods are bad. So these are things that we need to really be aware of so that when we're working with our clients and they've got gut issues, we can be working on these things with them as well. I always leave smoking to the last, mostly because they've been harped at forever. You know, someone somewhere tells them every week, you still smoke, you should quit. They don't need me as a nag. They need me as a support. So we'll start with the dietary stuff and make whatever improvements we can. And I'll ask them very gently, have you ever considered quitting? Have you ever tried? What worked the best for you? All right. That's good information for me. So when you are ready to, to do this again, there may be some herbal things and some other supports I can offer you. So if you would like me to be a part of your quitting smoking team, just let me know. And then I back away. And it sits on their table until they're ready to take advantage of it. Really important that we, we let them know what's available and that we, they know that we're supportive and that we're not here to nag them. I had one young man who was trying to quit smoking and he was quite young. He was like 19. And we had put some things in place and uh, he hung out with a lot of people who were smokers, which makes it so much harder. But I actually said to him, I said, this is really important. You're young enough that if you quit smoking, your body can forget that you ever smoked. It's not like you're 65 trying to quit and it's going to take us a while for your body to repair from 40 years of smoking. You've only been doing this for a couple of years. So we can do this. And I said, here's step one. If you're feeling like you're losing control with step one, here's step two. If that's not working for you, here's step three. And if that's not working for you, you phone me and I'll talk you out of a cigarette. You know, and so he phoned me a couple of times too. He said, oh, Mrs. Cobb, I just don't know. And I said, that's okay. Thanks for calling. And we talk about something else for, you know, five or 10 minutes and get him past the craving. And then he was good to go. All right. So what will you learn in uh, confident nutritionist to learn how to create programs right in your sessions and eliminate unpaid homework time. No more case study development for you. That doesn't work in a clinic. It works for a school to test and see what you know, but it doesn't work in real life. You will learn how to do a base assessment in five minutes or less without lengthy intake paperwork and you'll save time and do a better intake assessment. I'm going to show you two under five minute assessments uh, towards the end of our time together today. I'm going to, or you will learn how to ask only questions that are relevant to your client's needs. Those intake forms always ask that shotgun pattern where they're asking all kinds of questions that are totally irrelevant. So we want that laser focus that helps us to, to be precise in what we're doing. And because we've got that, it helps you to prioritize the problems your client needs help with. Your client will come in with a shopping list. I need help with this, 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 and this. And keeping that in mind while you're starting their iridology, you can then correlate their eyes to what they've brought in for a shopping list. And then you can more accurately pinpoint your starting point and start prioritizing the problems. You can choose which problem is going to have the biggest impact on all of them if you can get rid of that one problem. And you know, as you start doing that, you pick the problem that seems to be the root of everything because the eyes say it and because the symptoms say it and you address that and they see significant improvement in that within three or four weeks and then other things start to calm down a little bit, you become the hero. You really do. And they do your advertising for you after that. With, in the course, you'll learn how to connect what you already know about nutrition and or herbology with what you discover using dynamic iridology. 
you'll learn how to do a deeper assessment for more direction and understanding of your client's needs if and when it's needed. But you'll at least have an outline for five to six, the next five to six appointments, which is great because you're finding, you need to find fewer and fewer clients then to keep your schedule busy and full. And so how will you learn all that? Well, of course, in, in the course, I'm going to teach you beginning to intermediate iridology and sclerology at a level to prepare you for the IPA certification exam if you choose to certify. You don't have to choose to certify. There is an additional fee for that. And um, ultimately, again, you're, whether you choose to certify or not, you're going to get the same course content as the students who are enrolled in the same se section that you are that are certifying. So you're not getting a watered down course if you choose to not certify. I find a lot of my nutrition students don't want certification. They just want the knowledge and I'm good with that. Registration is open for confident nutritionist at iridology.education. Now, if you are a member of CANNP or IONC, you will be receiving links in your main newsletter that are special registration links for members of those organizations. And so if you're, really thinking, oh, I want to take this class, just hold off till you get your next newsletter. Or with CANNP, uh, they're upgrading special, they're upgrading newsletter that com will be coming out in May, early May, and it covers everything from May through November. And so you really want to make sure you keep your eyes open for those things. And again, if you're a, a, a herb, if you've got herbology background, don't worry about it because I tie in the nutrition and the herbalism as well. You just can't have a title that says confident nutritionist, herbologist, naturopath, you know, naturopath. It gets too long and cumbersome. Here's what you're going to get in the course. 20 live sessions, 20 live webinars, roughly 40 hours of live time, just like we're doing right now. Mic's open at all. Each class is recorded in its entirety and posted to a student website. The content is edited into short topic videos and it's stored on the student site for you to review for 18 months from our start date. After that 18 months, you're migrated to an alumni site that has all of the same content. I just uh, don't want to be having to maintain too many websites for past classes, so we just roll everybody into one, one big one. You get a digital textbook made available in weekly installments that you can print up or download, whichever works best for you. Cheat sheets to help you with your iris assessment. This is the ultimate synopsis of everything you learn. It's a, it turns out being a booklet that you can download, again, in weekly installments. And at the end of the course, I also have it compiled. So if you just want to download the one document, you can at that point in time. And this is the description of the markers, uh, what they look like, where they're found, questions you would ask, symptoms you would commonly see if there was a problem, if that was actually an active issue, recommendations you could make, both dietary and supplementary and lifestyle. So lots of really solid information that my students love the cheat sheets. Each class starts with a review of the previous week because if you're not solid on that, we cannot go forward. We need that foundation. Each week has a lot of in-class practice and interaction. I try to leave at least 30 minutes for us to practice in every class where we're actually looking at eye slides and working through everything we know so far, including the new material. Tons of practice. You get a certificate of attendance for attending 80% of the classes live. And often this will count for CEUs for other certifications that you are maintaining as well. You have support via a private Facebook group. And as soon as you register, um, I send you the invitation or you can request to be included in that private Facebook group. It is a Facebook group only for my students and my alumni. And it's meant as a support community. We talk about eyes. Um, if the student's having problems with an eye that in analysis and they want feedback, they can post the picture there and we talk about it. Um, it's a great place to just bat around holistic ideas that are focusing on iridology. So it's a nice way to support and it's a great way for me to keep in contact with my alumni. And every month we have a monthly Q&A office hours webinar that is also recorded. So students submit their cases that they want us to discuss or their questions. And we post, put them up like this on a webinar. We talk about them, we record that, and that gets uh, loaded up to the office hours site, which you also gain access to as soon as you register for the class. You don't have to wait for class to start. So what's the tuition? 
If you know right now that you want the training and the certification, the tuition is $19.95. But again, if you're a member of CANNP or IONC, watch for those newsletters. There are special links for you to use. And this is the complete course, all the curriculum, IPA exam part one and part two, which are the parts that I get to administer. And towards the end of your course, I gift you with an IPA student membership because to do the certification exam, the final exam with IPA, you have to have a current membership, right? And so we'll get you started this way and that way you're ready for the exam if you choose to do that. If you aren't sure if you wanna certify or maybe you actually know you don't wanna certify, tuition is $14.95 Canadian. Again, if you're located in the States, you're gonna pay about 30% less because that's roughly what the exchange is on the dollar. Um, this is the course only, but it is the exact same content that the certification students get because you're sitting together in the class. And I'm not gonna say if you're not certifying, plug your ears. It doesn't quite work like that. And so the beauty of this is, of course, you do it from the comfort of your own home. You have no travel, you have no hotel, you don't have to pay for meals, you don't have to take time off work. You've got that two hour block once a week that you're doing the course and then you can be doing your practice and your review between sessions, but it makes it so much easier because you don't have those other expenses, especially if you're just starting out your business. The other thing is when you start seeing how much content there is, I actually think it's kind of ridiculous that people try to teach this as a five day live face to face class. Because often at the end of our two hours, students are going, wow, that was a lot. Well, if you kept packing that on top of each other, on top of each other, by the end of day two, you would shut your brain off and the last three days would be almost, almost not worth attending because you wouldn't get it. Okay, so I love the idea of spreading it out. A little bit more about the IPA certification exam. It's a three-part exam. Again, part one, I administer, I give you 10 sets of iris photos digitally and I supply those photos, you do an analysis on the forms that we provide, send it to me, I mark your work, then you and I spend an hour together in private tutorial to review your work and make sure you are solid. I've had students where at the end of the 10, I was like, do you feel solid? And they'd go, no, and I go, I'm so glad you said that because I don't think you're solid either. I wanna send you some more. I'm gonna send you three more and I want you to just practice at home for a little while and then do these three and then send them in. And it makes such a difference. When they're solid, then I can send them the analysis that IPA provides, which is one iris analysis. You do it, you send it to me, I mark your work. We go over it together again in a private tutorial. And again, we decide together, are you solid? Are you ready to do the final final? And if we both agree that you are, great. If not, I send you another IPA one. Right? I want you passing the test on the first go round, not on the third. And so when we agree, then I let IPA know that you are ready and you send them your exam application and the exam fee, which currently is 175 US, and they will send you the exam to do and go from there. Okay, and then we all sit on pins and needles while we wait for the results to come in. But again, my goal is always to have my students pass the first time. Another case study, this is a male age 63. And so um, I'm just gonna do another quick little poll here. If you were listening carefully, you might've got this. If you weren't, it, it might've slipped past you, I don't know. And that is, choose the right answer. Which of, um, this is a good choice to help reduce heartburn. Slippery elm, coffee, oatmeal, orange juice, tomatoes. I mentioned it really fast when we were talking about the plumber. Yay! Do you have a little bit of herbal background as well? No, I don't. No, okay. No. You were just listening really well, or you knew the others were bad. Okay. Yeah, a little bit about. <laughs> a little bit about that, and that's perfect, right? That's I'm really happy with that. I can go with that. There so you go. Th this fellow, 63 years old. He comes from a family that has a long line of stomach problems. And um, his stomach has not been really great for quite a few years. You know, a good day, it's, it's okay, but there's a, not as many good days as he would like to have. Recently, 
in an effort to kill the pain of a toothache while he was working out of town and couldn't get to the dentist for five days, he overdosed on extra strength Advil. By day two of this overdosing process, he was feeling constantly nauseated. And by day three, the stomach pain was, was as bad as the toothache. And he didn't connect the dots until he got home and realized that what he had probably done was actually created an ulcer because that is one of the potential side effects of Advil. And he was doing the extra strength ones, like I said, that were 600 milligrams, two at a time. You're supposed to do no more than two every eight hours. He was doing two every four hours. And so looking at his eyes, I could see that he's got a stomach ring. He's definitely got a stomach ring going on here. I could see that he's got a fairly wide gray border. And I can see they're not black, but they are gray. He's got some gray uh, comb teeth. So genetically, his stomach's not great, right? And so his eyes are telling us that Advil or not, his stomach wasn't well put together genetically. And um, so we, we really needed to do some serious work because, you know, once you've got an ulcer, like I mentioned earlier, it's hard to heal because you ha often what doctors will do is they will give a proton pump inhibitor to kill the acid and they'll give an antibiotic for the H. pylori that moves in when the ulcer is forming. And that'll allow it to heal. But while you're doing that, your digestion is garbage, absolute garbage. And so we needed to work with this man in a slightly different way. And so um, because I've worked with him for quite a while, the first step was to, to begin working with that stomach. And so I love kefir. I love kefir for stomach problems. It is my number one go-to. It, it calms acid reflux. It brings immediate relief. So we got him drinking kefir and I said at least a quarter of a cup three times a day. More if you want. It's not going to hurt you. More if you want. There was an article published online on a site called PLOS1, a peer-reviewed open access journal. It was published in 2015 and it suggests that the purpose of the stomach is not just to break food down uh, chemically, but that it's also to filter out microbes that are not going to be a benefit in the intestinal tract. And it states that when the stomach acid is off, the gut biome suffers. I totally get it. Totally get it. There was another article published in the, front, in the Journal of Frontiers and Microbiology in 2016, also published online. And it, it really went through all of the benefits and all of the, it was a, a review of studies that had been published as to the, the efficacy of kefir for many health problems, including digestive symptoms. And they listed a ton of different things that kefir could be used for. So another great option here, as you're probably aware, is to use fermented foods. Uh, the, the kefir was not such a hard sell because this fellow really likes yogurt and he thought it would be very similar and it is sort of. When I suggested fermented foods, it was obvious that recommendation went over like a lead balloon. He was not going to ferment his own vegetables and he was not going to eat them even if he did ferment them. So we just had to leave that alone. I would have loved to have added some prebiotics to him, which the fermented vegetables does as well. Um, again, that would include raw garlic, it would include underripe bananas, um, chicory root, raw chicory root or raw asparagus, and those were a no-go as well. So instead, what we did is we went to supplements because I knew he would do that. So some aloe vera juice, and we had him do a quarter of a cup a couple of times a day, um, dovetailing it with the kefir. We did a nature sunshine blend called ULCR Plus, which includes the deglycerizinated licorice. And if you've done any studying on H. pylori bacteria, deglycer deglycerizinated licorice is uh, a modified herb that has been shown to kill the H. pylori, or at least put it in its place, without upsetting the rest of the flora in the gut. So that was a plus. 
and of course some slippery elm. We had him actually opening the slippery elm, mixing it with a bit of water and making it into a really thick paste and just sucking that down periodically because the slippery elm will help to coat the stomach and protect it from the digestive acids, kind of like a liquid Band-Aid, if you will. And so we did those kinds of things and it's, it's he still has problems. This uh, initially, he came to me with this problem It'd be February, early February. He still has some problems, not as frequent or as severe as what it was when we started working. There is significant improvement, but boy, we've still got a long way to go to even get him to where he was before. And as we look in his eyes here, there is no marking that says ulcer because the ulcer is not genetic. There's no genetic program that says you will have an ulcer here. But we can see with everything else that's going on in here from the little bits of comb teeth to the gray border to the stomach ring that the stomach is a weak link. And so we would expect to see more symptoms there. And over time, I'm educating him as to what he needs to do to protect his stomach. So important together. So are you starting to see how the nutrition and the iridology can really work together? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So why would you want to study with me? Besides the fact that you're already on your third session with me and you're loving it. Uh, you wouldn't be back for three if you weren't loving it. Um, and be, well, partially because I've been where you are and I get the financial and time constraints of running a business, taking care of family, home, friends, and other important commitments. I understand there's a lot to learn about iridology and sclerology. And that's why we do it as 20 sessions, not one big dip you in the boiling oil session. And I don't care where you live, it's cheaper to study with someone who's in Canada because I'm charging in Canadian dollars. So often classes are, that are online are in the US or even if they're in Canada, the teachers are, te are charging American dollars and I'm charging in Canadian. It just makes it so much easier for everybody. So again, some uh, some testimonials from students. Michelle Davies, who's CN, CNP and RNCP, so she's got training very similar to where you're, you're headed. She was came to me well certified in iridology. She had lots of, of training already. This is what she said about the class. This is the most amazing iridology course I've taken. Judith's course is top on my list. Judith is very enthusiastic and excited as we are in the course. She has many good examples and stories to share that makes the course that much more real in today's world. I think we learn better when we see live real cases. I really do. Judith's iridology course is very informative, descriptive, and complete as it contains the most accurate iridology, including sclerology, and most importantly, how to put it all together and make a proper assessment I feel most confident in my nutrition practice now. We also have Allison Taylor, who was working on her holistic, I'm not sure what her designation was going to be, but it included nutrition and herbs and all kinds of stuff. And she says, Judith's teaching is professional, easy to learn, um, student web page and the videos, absolutely. I would definitely recommend this course to anyone who's even thinking of taking an iridology course. Judith is a wealth of knowledge and a fantastic mentor. I love this course and I know you will too. Now, it's interesting that she did my course and some of the other, the, the school she was with had arranged for another instructor to come in from out of town, but they were unable to get enough students and the teacher canceled. And that was the understanding if they couldn't get enough students, the teacher would not come. And so the students were self-teaching and doing correspondence courses. And when the students would get together to do their practicums for other parts of the curriculum they were working on, um, the other students were struggling. And Allison said, they are so jealous of the fact that I've got a live teacher who has given me unlimited access that I actually get to converse and talk every week to learn and to clarify. And she said, they're all struggling and they wish they had done it this way instead. So that's kind of cool. And this one from Karen Choate, who, um, and her signature isn't on here, that's bizarre. She also came to me as a CNHP and she says, it's been such a pleasure studying under you and learning from you. I really miss our classes. I hear that a lot. But I'm looking forward to completing this component of iridology and continuing my education most hopefully with you. 
And that's as I continue, continue to develop other programs to teach online. I have become <clears throat> much more comfortable with taking photos of my patient's eyes and I have begun to implement this incredible work in my practice quite successfully. It truly has helped immensely in my decisions and assessments. Thank you for sharing your skill, your knowledge and your patience. Let's do another case study. This is a male age 35. Oh, let's do a, a quick little quiz again. You'll, this is an easy one again. You'll get this one. Which of these, and you can choose more than one, support better digestion? Kefir, soda, fermented foods, coffee, or chocolate? You can choose more than one. Yep, do you want to choose one more? It won't let me. I tried, but I would have chosen oh. the fermented foods one. Excellent. Thank you. So I probably didn't quite set that up right. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're I'll have to make sure I set that up right for the evening group. Okay. Um, and so did you study a lot about kefir and fermented foods in your, in your training? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Brilliant. They're such a good thing to lean back on and to teach your, your clients about. I'm always suggesting that my clients learn how to ferment veggies. Mm-hmm. So this is a male, age 35. You know, it's interesting that I have more men with gut problems than women. I think it goes back to the thing that women are more likely to seek help earlier in, a, in the process than men are. By the time they come in, yeah, they're kind of really in trouble. So this fellow came to me just recently complaining of, I wanna know what you're, you think when you hear this set of symptoms. Shortness of breath, dizziness, tightness in his chest and heartburn. Where does that send your, your brain? Um, Shortness of breath, dizziness, tightness in his chest, and heartburn. I want to say circulatory cardiovascular systems. Yeah, yeah. Those are all symptoms of a heart attack. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa. So my first thing was, yes, I will absolutely work with you, but you need to go see your doctor right now. Like, mm -hmm. do not go past go. Like, go see your doctor first. Um, so they've been running tests and he's just been coming to me for about the last six weeks. They're running tests. Uh, and as we, as we started working, he told me that heart disease runs in his family, but he was also born into a family where they're very nutrition conscious. He was raised using herbs and vitamins. So he may have been his, his parents and he may be the first generation to turn the heart disease around, which is what we're hoping because his, uh, one of his grandfathers had his first heart attack at the age of 40. Okay, so really not a good, not a good genetic background here. And so, um, so we, with him then, when we look at this picture up here, again, we don't see a gray border, but we can see there is a slightly different shade coming at the edge here. It's It's darker. And that's because there's so much brown in the eye, orange and brown. This is not going to be gray, it's going to be a darker brown. So we see that he's got the gray border starting. We look and we see he's got lots of minor radial furrows, so we know he's got interruption in the nerve feed to the stomach. If you look carefully, you can see that right along here, there's a little bit of an edge that is showing us that he's got a stomach ring. And so he's got lots of stuff happening. He's also got contraction furrows out here, which tell us that he lives in the sympathetic response zone. So what do you know about the sympathetic response zone and digestion? Basically, digestion slows down when we're under stress. Yeah, absolutely. It slows down and stops. It Basically. really, yeah, right. And so he's got a stomach that is genetically not great. And he lives on the edge nerve wise, always just waiting for the next bomb to go off. Right. And so always just sort of on the edge of fight or flight. And so, um, so sent him to his doctor, his doctors recommended, of course, tests, gave him a sample of proton pump inhibitor told him to take baby aspirin every day because of the family history and gave him a corticosteroid inhaler because wondered if it might actually be asthma because this young man also has a history of asthma. 
So I didn't like anything the doctor recommended, but so I suggested that he should get assessed for a hiatal hernia. Now, do you know how to assess for a hiatal hernia? How to assess for it? No. Okay. I know, so this I know is, what it is. That's it, though. <laughs> okay, good. So this is actually pretty easy to assess for. So you start with your client just sitting or standing straight, and you ask them to take a really deep breath, and you watch how their torso handles it. Typically, most people will go, so they're lifting the rib cage in order to get the breath. So when I see that, I will change the instructions. And I always want to do that one first. It gives me a baseline. I'll try to get it in front of my camera here. I'll change the instructions. And I'll say, put your hand on your belly button. This time when you take a deep breath, I want you to breathe to your hand and use your diaphragm to make your stomach go out. So it should be like, Could you see that movement? Yes. Okay. So if they cannot do this, if they can't get this going, this is all diaphragm here. If they can't get the diaphragm moving, it is locked into a hiatal hernia. Okay. And if, if they've got that hiatal hernia, so that stomach is coming up like this through the diaphragm, mm -hmm. the diaphragm can't move, but the stomach can also not massage the food properly. And we get this bubble of stomach up here that traps the acidic food and lets it backwash really easily. And hiatal hernia, when you look it up, can create every symptom of a heart attack. Really? Huh. Absolutely. And That's so interesting. It's an, isn't it though? Yes. And so while you and I cannot actually diagnose hiatal hernia, we can assess for it. And then we can send the client out to a chiropractor who knows how to unlock the diaphragm because chiropractors also cannot diagnose or assess hiatal hernias. But they can assess a locked diaphragm and they can correct a locked diaphragm through uh, visceral manipulations on the abdomen. Very cool. It is very cool. You know, if you can solve a problem like that by sending them out to a chiropractor for a very painful manipulation and get it done, and have significant improvement in the digestion just from that and in the breathing it's a good thing so this young man is still waiting to get into the chiropractor he has an appointment and is just waiting for that so really important as a nutrition uh, practitioner to make sure that you have that list of people that you can refer out to people who do complementary things that your clients may need Okay. Right, and so a chiropractor who knows how to unlock a diaphragm is a really good one. Um, you know, maybe knowing who the midwives are, knowing someone who does really good um, adjustments, whether it's chiropractic or Dorn or whatever you prefer, knowing different types of massage therapists, and just being able to send them out so there's no conflict. You're not sending them out to someone who's going to say, oh, well, I can take care of everything for you. Mm -hmm. But they've got that specialty that you need. And so, um, again, so that's where we're at with this fellow. I haven't actually recommended any dietary changes at this stage of the game with him because I, I want to see what happens with the hiatal hernia. Now, his medical doctor did do a chest X-ray to see if there was anything in the lungs. And, and the doctor says, says, there's no hiatal hernia here. It's not showing up on the X-ray. And yet, hiatal hernia doesn't always have to show up on an x-ray and I don't know why that is. I just know that I've had a ton of clients that have had the same breathing and digestion problems. I've sent them for just the, the hiatal hernia adjustment. I've, and I've got a few chiropractors where I've said, you don't touch anything else because I'm not a fan of chiro. So you don't touch anything else. I'll send you an unlimited stream of hiatal hernia people, but don't you touch anything else unless the patient asks for it and these chiros are okay with that and the, the my clients come back to me feeling 127 percent better so it's just a good thing to know who to refer out to all right so again it doesn't matter what background you've got whether it's nutrition or herbology iridology is such a fabulous adjunct and it just helps you to draw on everything you know so much more effectively and again, the tuition, 1995, 
Um, which which nutrition organization will you be affiliated with, CANNP or IONC? Uh, CANNP. Okay. Yeah. So watch for their their big update that comes out either end of April or early May, and um, okay. and use the link. Now, if you prefer a four pay, again, there will be a special link there for your four pay, um, but four pay of four four payments of five hundred and forty nine. If you want the full meal deal, or four payments of four nineteen, if you want the course without certification, I love payment plans. I do a lot on payment plans just because it's more affordable, and um, it's with it being spread out, it gives me time to earn the money in between rather than yeah, having to come up with a huge lump sum. Right? That lump yeah. sum is great if you've been stashing a little bit, aiming towards it, but. When you see a golden opportunity and you know you don't have that much in your hip pocket, but you know you could come up with this in a mm -hmm. one payment a month of that, it just, yeah, why wait? So again, the course begins Thursday, May 31st um, and goes to late October. Now, this go around is going to be a little bit different than others as far as scheduling. And I just want to explain this up front. I always schedule one or two weeks off throughout the 20 weeks so that it actually runs like 22 weeks for sort of a reading week to give you time to go back and review and maybe catch up on life or have a vacation who knows right um, this year this time around I can't schedule those dates we're expecting some very significant events in our family that we don't know exactly when but when they happen I will be posting on the Facebook page and I'll try to send out an email if I have clarity of thought to do that um, just saying that I need the two weeks off right now back to back right and so um yeah I shouldn't talk about that so much we're expecting my father to pass away within the next few months and so um I'm reserving the right to take two weeks off when that happens to get myself pulled together and deal with what needs to be dealt with and so we will be finished by the end of October regardless there we go Okay, so what are the benefits? Well, no more unpaid homework time. No more case studies that don't need to be done. You finish case studies when you pass your last test on Friday. You'll be able to help create or be able to create therapeutic sequences in your sessions that will keep your clients coming back. So important when you see your client the first time, you've got their history, you know where you're going, you give them that first step of homework, let them know this is where we're starting. This is what I'm going to ask you to do this month. Can you do that? And then and next time when I see you a month from now, I would. Uh, this is where I think we're going to be heading. We'll monitor your progress, and if you're ready, this will be the next step. Uh, clients like to know what the next step is and that you're not flying blind. And if you can give them that little glimpse of the roadmap at the end of each appointment, where are we heading next time, that keeps them wanting to do the homework and wanting to come back. You'll be able to eliminate those lengthy intake questionnaires. You'll be able to develop rapport within minutes. And you will be more precise in your client work. You know, having all of this in place, it engenders trust. Your clients will love it. They will absolutely love that, that they know where, that you know what you're doing. Oh, how did that end up on there twice? That's fun. Okay, so... Um, let me just see where we're at. Case study again. We got to be ripping through these. Oh, no, we're good. We're good. We're totally good. So um, this, I'm just going to demonstrate a five minute analysis here. So this fellow came into me complaining of gut issues that look sort of IBS ish. And as I looked at his eyes, whoops, here's what I noted. We've got the gray border, which because the center of his eye is darker is actually a brown border. We've got a stomach ring. We've got lots of these minor radial furrows, so we know we've got some very fine comb teeth in there. That in and of itself tells me he's more prone to gut issues. When we add to it that this ring that is coming around here is not really a, excuse me, a fairly smooth ring. It's actually a very jagged starburst. <clears throat> a very jagged starburst, that again tells me that his bowel is very prone to spasticity. So if we have this problem in the stomach and then we've got this bowel that balloons and constricts and balloons and constricts, 
we know that he's really a candidate for IBS. When we look at the texture of that ring, not just the shape of it, but the texture, how thick it is, how thin it is, that gives me more information. I look and I see all of these closed petal shapes or diamonds that are here. Tells me he's got a creative side, but he's also prone to blood sugar imbalances. I look at things like these fibers that are skittering across and here like this. Tells me he's prone to arthritis and or osteoporosis, some kind of joint or bone issue. Um, and the fact that there's a blue base tells me he's more prone to being more acidic throughout his whole body. And the colors in the center of us, his eye tell me that we are looking at the genetic potential of some liver imbalances and some kidney imbalances. In traditional Chinese medicine, kidneys regulate bones. And um, the liver, of course, regulates just anything it wants to regulate because it does over 500 different jobs. So we have a lot. Oh, we also have this bit of a white haze up here which again suggests a liver enzyme imbalance that could be setting up a lipid imbalance in his blood that could lead to elevated cholesterol and hardening of the arteries. So, you know, when I, I see that, that was less, less than five minutes. I know it was. That was maybe two minutes. And I already have that shell of information that I want to work with. He also lives a little bit. We've got these lines that come around here, these wrinkles um, that tells us he lives in the sympathetic zone. You know, so we need to talk digestion with him. We need to talk lifestyle. We need to be working with him to teach him how to relax, that he needs his relaxed time every day. If I was working with him for the very first time today, I would note um, all of the things that I just rattled off to you, just like I listed them. And I asked him about his personal and family history uh, of protein digestion, of blood lipids, energy, circulation, um, wound healing. And from there, I would make one or two recommendations for digestion and one recommendation for whatever he came to see me with. So see me back. So he, his first concern was that his gut was pretty spastic and painful. And he was finding he was spending more and more time in difficulties. So I would definitely take away the coffee. And I would probably add in uh, some mucilage, like some slippery elm and some kefir. And that's probably where I would start with him. Now, all of the eyes we've looked at today have been light eyes. And it's real. It's true. It's true. Blue eyes are easier to read. They're easier to learn on. That's why I use so many of them in these webinars. But people have darker eyes, too. And you have to know that there is a ton of information in these darker eyes. So as we look at this beautiful set of brown eyes, this is a male age 23. He came to me um, with gout. He's had gout since he was 17. He is overweight by about 40 pounds. And I've seen pictures of him as a teenager and he was slender. He was very slender. And now he is very square and boxy. So as we look at his eyes, again, we see that we've got a darker edge, a dark brown edge to the pupil border. So that's ding number one against stomach. We see, again, a lot of the little radial furrows in, in that stomach zone. So we know that there is probably impaired nerve feed to the stomach. So that's ding number two. We look at the ring that comes around here. And what we see is there's lots of little places where there are little black holes, either just inside or just outside. The ones inside tell us that there are probably compromises in his large intestine because of where they're located. So we've got that we want to be aware of. He lives in the sympathetic zone. Always. He's always on edge. This purple haze at the edge tells us circulation doesn't go all the way to the extremities of his body. And at his young age, we've got this very white haze starting. He's already setting up the blood lipid issues. The brown eye where it's generally brown, again, tells us that he is more likely to have some kind of liver something, and that ties in beautifully with this white ring. So if I was to see him for the very first time today again, certainly we would assess diet. Now, I know he doesn't drink uh, coffee, but he drinks a lot of pop. And um, so and with the gout, the pop's not a great idea. So our first goal 
would be to get him replacing the pop with something else and maybe we get him to cut it down to a liter a day. He doesn't drink cola, but it's ginger ale or 7 Up are his favorites. So maybe we get him drinking water with chlorophyll in it so that he's drinking something that has some flavor, but it's not going to be destructive to him the way pop is. We're going to uh, maybe see if he will buy into learning to meditate for 10 or 15 minutes a day to help him relax and get out of that zone of fast reaction. Um, he is of Asian descent and his diet is that, that mix of fast Asian and lousy North American. So lots of rice and lots of fast food. And so we need to start working with that and get him to incorporate some leafy greens and maybe begin reducing things. And what I often like to do with people like this, where I know there's gonna be a ton of pushback, is rather than me saying, you have to give up this and this and this and this, because you know we all turn into three-year-olds then, don't we? You tell me I have to give up my one piece of cheesecake a week, I am gonna turn into the biggest three-year-old you've ever seen. And I want it, but I want it, it's the only thing I do wrong, I can have my cheesecake, right? And so rather than doing that and getting that pushback, I will often with someone like this say, well, uh, let's let's see if you can begin replacing the pop with some chlorophyll and water. And let's have you add in some leafy greens. So I'm not taking away very much, but I'm adding in. And the ultimate goal is to get him focusing on what to add in and see if it can crowd some of the bad stuff out. So it's a very, very gentle approach. And I really like to go that direction to help with this. All right. So any questions for me? as we are just getting ready to wrap up. Uh, so far, so good. Awesome. It's a, awesome. It's a lot of information, so I don't even know where to start, to be honest, with questions. But, but yeah. you know what? Can you imagine if you sat through five, eight-hour days of that kind of information? It'd be too much. <laughs> your, brain would, too much. your brain would be in a blender, wouldn't it? It would be mush. Yes. Yes. You know, yeah. And so, you know, so to give it in smaller doses and then have time to discuss it and time to practice it is, I think, just okay. sound. Yeah. So again, there's the tuitions. And because you're with CANNP, just wait for their newsletter. If you're if you're chomping at the bit to get registered and space is limited, registrations are starting to come in already. Um, but my biggest registrations always come from CANNP and IONC. And so um, you, you should be OK until then and uh, take advantage of, of uh, the links that I provided for them. All righty. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you again. You're welcome. Have a good one. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.